Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining this launch of uh, this uh, document we've put on the air uh, today, uh, titled The Genomic Revolution. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, I am John Chisholm. Uh, I co-chair uh, this work together with Mark Caulfield. And this morning we have three of the other chairs or co-chairs of uh, three uh, of our main themes, uh, being uh, Noel Gordon, uh, Sharon Peacock, and Gil McVean, and they will be talking uh, later on. Um, so uh, why, uh, have, why have we done it? Why did PPP P P P ask us to do it? It's because uh, more than a year ago, about at the time uh, the first lockdown in the UK was at its peak, it was already apparent uh, that genomics uh, was going to be uh, important. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, I and Mark were asked to um, bring together uh, the community as to what the thoughts as to how to go forward to build what we were learning about genomics. Um, at that time, uh, Mark and I felt that it was a little early, um, that the story of this uh, pandemic uh, was going to develop significantly. And so we held, uh, our, um, held up uh, to watch what happened. It was a good thing we did because, of course, the world has had a chance to learn a tremendous amount. This turned out uh, to be an event of uh, the greatest significance uh, since the end of the Second World War for global affairs. Uh, a um, virus which there's no known cure spread rapidly around the world. Uh, with devastation in so many places. Um, science came to the rescue. Uh, in fantastically short time, uh, we were able to generate some um, vaccines. Uh, we were able to institute large-scale uh, sequencing of the um, genome of, of the virus uh, and institute very large trials. Um, and at the center of all of that was genomics. So here we are um, talking about how we should go forward and uh, recognizing that the UK is extraordinarily good at genomics and therefore has something really to offer in the world. Uh, so our aim in, in this work is to pick up from that uh, and think about not just the short term, but the long term of, of how to capture uh, what we have learned uh, in the genomics field and build it to the maximum utility. Um, we have done this uh, by uh, bringing on board more than 100 key knowledge holders uh, to help us. And if I can have the first, I think need my only slide up, uh, please. Um, we have and uh, the heading of seven uh, key themes, which we thought were the most important uh, for us to think about this time. Uh, you'll be hearing about the first three, the integrated advanced analytics and infrastructure, uh, pathogen surveillance uh, and infection management and prevention and detection uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the three uh, uh, co-hosts, uh, co-chairs of those uh, endeavors. Mark will be uh, talking in a few minutes about the uh, cancer, uh, uh, functional genomics and, uh, and therapeutic interventions, uh, the ethics uh, and the global horizon uh, in just a moment or two. So that is what we're going to cover uh, today. Um, we have you will find in the report which has just been sent to you uh, that across these themes, uh, our uh, expert teams have identified 25 specific action items to get the UK to the position of realizing its potential. But across all of those, 
uh, a point that I'd like to make is that there is a key uh, thing uh, that links them all together and which the UK uh, could perhaps distinguish itself amongst all other nations. Uh, to be successful in realizing uh, uh, genomics, uh, you have to be a country with a sufficiently large and diverse uh, population. Uh, you have to have real deep expertise uh, in uh, genomics uh, and uh, the science of genomics uh, and the application of it in, in the clinics. Uh, and you also have to have a um, governmental infrastructure uh, that can bring that all together. And uh, bringing it together, given that uh, genomics is the science of very large numbers and is dealing in an arena, arena where quite naturally uh, the, uh, uh, the implementation tends to be fragmented, being able to draw it together uh, in a coordinated way to create an ecosystem uh, which works across all the communities uh, from academia uh, to industry, to clinicians, to regulators, bringing them together in a coordinated way to maximize the benefits of, of the science. That is something which governments, uh, a government can really only do. And our biggest recommendation, which runs across all the rest, uh, is the need is that the government should seize this opportunity to do what it has done pretty well in the pandemic uh, and to uh, um, uh, give itself the ability to oversee across all the communities uh, what, what, what is happening and then how uh, to develop the capabilities and the instruments uh, to uh, affect action. So an observatory and an orchestration function um, uh, would be extremely helpful and perhaps could uh, lie under the National Genomics Board, which the, the government has already got in place. So those are my uh, opening remarks. I'd now like to pass over uh, to Mark uh, for his opening comments. Good afternoon, everybody, and I'd like to thank my uh, co-chair, Sir John Chisholm, uh, for partnering me in this and uh, doing a fantastic job. Um, I'd also like to add my welcome to each and every one of you. I think this nation sits at a juncture when it can take genomics to a completely new level. We're in the vanguard and in some cases well ahead of other health systems and its adoption. And as John has said, the power of the genomics has come to the fore during the pandemic. So if we go to the next slide. So I'm just going to now um, run through some uh, recommendations from the sections of the report uh, where the co-chairs are not speaking. So you've heard that there are seven pillars to the report. I'm going to be talking about them uh, in order from cancer and early detection surveillance. So uh, this was uh, chaired excellently by Jackie Shaw, who we owe a debt of thanks to. And this focused on uh, possible hereditary predisposition to cancer. So something you or I might inherit from our mum and dad, but also how we might detect cancer earlier and uh, the um, cancer uh, circulating tumor DNA, the DNA fragments that are liberated from a tumor could potentially be used throughout the cancer pathway. And so the recommendations were that we evaluated how we would use this in screening diagnosis and identifying relapse or occurrence. Um, it was felt that a roadmap via a technology agnostic platform, in other words, a platform that could be created associated with the National Health Service um, that actually would test emerging new measurements of cell-free DNA, would create an open platform that would allow uh, commercial partners and academia to optimize the cell-free DNA technologies, which may need further work before being adoptable by healthcare. Uh, this could enable the acceleration and evaluation of cell-free DNA as a potential technology 
to be adopted onto the National Genomic Test Directory. And one of the things we have here in the UK is a National Genomic Test Directory, which is a, a directory, not a catalogue or a guideline. And it is about what we should do in the health system. Future cancer care is expected to be multimodal. By that, um, we will probably be integrating clinical data from routine healthcare, imaging, digital pathology, multiomics, which means measuring the genome, uh, how the genome is converted into a protein, the RNA, but the protein then, and perhaps even uh, tumor metabolism. And so um, this uh, could it be an extension to a, a cell-free DNA assay of enabling earlier precision cancer care. And the final recommendation from this area is that we need a first-in-class multimodal test platform that could transform cancer detection and allow us to migrate normally the later stage presentations of the DNI health system to an earlier presentation where we could affect cure. If we go to the next slide. I'm going to talk about functional genomics. Now, programs that are being uh, developed across the world that are beginning to use whole genome sequencing or even those on more earlier technologies such as gene chips are producing many, many variations in your and my genetic code that actually we do not know what their function is or whether they're a marker of some other part of your and my genetic code that does have a function. This group was very ably chaired by Gossia Trinka from the Sanger Center. And this came up with a range of recommendations, which is about converting uh, the patient's variation into function that can pave the way for migrating from function to biological insight to treatment. And without function, we can't do that. And in industry, it is now established that drugs that are genomically primed can be two and a half times more likely to make it to clinical use in the health service. So our recommendations are that UK academia and industry and the NHS should combine skills and expertise to work together in a collaborative framework that crosses the nation on large scale projects that are focused on layering function on the variation that we discover in the human genome that affects disease. We also felt that every doctor should be trained in data analysis. Data is becoming part of the fabric of everyday life and that some should undergo master's level training in genomic analysis or data analysis of healthcare data. The technology is moving very fast and the United Kingdom needs to continue to invest in the scientific research that underpins technology development to enable us to engineer and test the role of human variants at scale. And we recommended the government should support over the next five years a coming together of individual platforms to create a national platform, some of which already exists, and to accelerate the progress of gene identification to function to treatment, bringing the benefits of genomics to life for every patient in the NHS. Next slide. This is a very important area of the report. This is about ethics and the public and patient perspective. And again, was brilliantly chaired by Professor Jonathan Montgomery. Uh, Sir Jonathan's team recommended that there should be a new human genetics commission responsible for public and patient deliberation on the ethical development and application of genome science, especially as today we cannot foresee all the applications involving the patients and public, getting the barometer of what they would like to see before, during and after, entering a, uh, an episode of research or adoption will be very important in the future. The first task of that com commission should be to have a public dialogue that brings a wide range of patients and publics together, and that there should be also a genomics watchdog or ombudsman for the public to raise concerns if they believe that their genomic data has not been used correctly. Next slide. The final group I'm going to represent today was ably chaired by Peter Goodhand and Simon Linnett, and that looked at global horizons in genomics. So this uh, group recommended that the UK should promote a global initiative to collect more diverse populations and involve them in genomic studies. This is very important, and there are specific consortia that are seeking to combine the world's 
diverse communities such as the International 100K Cohorts Consortium. There needed to be large-scale international collaboration and greater investment in programs to move from variant to function, echoing works of the Functional Genomics Panel. And there also should be a global genomic surveillance network to identify emerging pathogens and ensure that best practice and standardization of pathogen sequencing were universally adopted for surveillance and analysis. That concludes the recommendations from my section, John, and I will hand back to you to invite the other speakers. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mark. Um, just to, to remind you that if you have questions, do put up questions on the Q&A uh, button on your uh, screen, because we will have time <coughs> for some questions uh, after our speakers have concluded. Uh, so let me start with the, uh, the first of the specific themes uh, a chair or co-chair are going to talk about. Uh, Noel, can I turn to you? Uh, for integrated advanced analytics and infrastructure. Many, <clears throat> many thanks, John. Um, it's a pleasure to have this opportunity to present the findings and recommendations of our work stream on integrated advanced analytics and infrastructure, which was co-chaired by my very distinguished colleague, Professor Andrew Morris and myself. And uh, although Andrew can't be with us today, he's certainly been with us in spirit throughout the whole of our journey here. Um, with your permission, I'd like to start by thanking all the participants in our two workshops. We had more than 30 in the end who stayed with us through the course of our analysis. They represented a very wide spectrum of expertise and all practitioners in their field. I suppose we were united by a very powerful common purpose in this work, which is a belief that the UK really must capitalize on a revolution in genomic science and a parallel revolution in digital technologies, which we believe can deliver practical breakthroughs to the way Humanity at large lives, works, and ages. That, um, on to the next slide, please. Yeah, thanks. Um, so our work stream sort of first dealt with the fundamental question of how best to leverage this parallel revolution in digital technologies to enable new genomic breakthroughs in science and medicine. Why did we dwell, in, dwell on this issue of a tipping point, as we defined it, in convergent technologies? Well, it's because over the last 10 years, uh, we've, we've now reached a point where multiple innovations in data, cloud, AI, mobile, have converged to provide a set of solutions which we think are seminal in, in the way we manage data and produce insight. Uh, we've got very good in this country at managing very large or massive data sets. We've got cheap and secure cloud. Through a lot of work that Andrew has done in HCR UK, we've pioneered use of federated data on-premise access and distributed access with relevant protocols. We've started to deal with the sort of intractable, pro intractable problem in many ways of the way the NHS has um, siloed data sets, which take us into the world of interoperability. We've got a tremendous SME cohort in our industrial structure, which is developing lots of innovations in AI tools many of which will help us with cleansing. Uh, analytics is exponentially advancing almost every week. And we've now got tools to give patients power over the way they can control their data for use. So we, we obviously respect all of the work streams um, in, this, uh, in this project. Um, and our job was to try and find ways in which we can leverage this 
revolution in convergent technologies to enable the genomics revolution to take place. Next, uh, next slide, please. Um, I suppose our second main belief was that the UK has two extraordinary national assets. I won't argue that they're, they're the best in the world, but I'd certainly argue they're world class. Uh, and that is our technology infrastructure and our pools of health data. But alongside that, you know, we're constantly trying to conduct a transformation of health infrastructure and health data to make it fit for future purpose. And we have a few challenges to deal with. Our health data is plentiful but it's highly fragmented and it's grown up in silo structures which don't really lend themselves to the sort of connected data world that we're envisaging here. We've worked through ethics and governance, um, but it's not yet really designed for the type of genomics revolution that we're describing here. And as the ethics work stream concluded, there is still a way to go. We have to uh, make the most of the tailwind that we think we have in respect to patients' trust and actually consumer trust in science generally. Um, but this needs continuous confidence building. And as we'll talk about, I think throughout the rest of the morning, continuous conf confidence building is an absolutely key plank of the way we need to go. We're good at delivering digital backbones. We've proven that, um, if I modestly claim through NHS Digital, we have some of the most resilient digital infrastructure of any country. But the data that we're pushing through those pipes isn't clean enough. And uh, you'll see a recommendation later on where we think the government has to step up to help us fund a major data cleansing exercise. Uh, and finally, we've got a very sophisticated AI and analytics ecosystem in and around the NHS, uh, which is constantly bringing new tools and innovations to us. But we now need to sort of converge this fleet of speedboats, as I'd call it, more into a convoy and ultimately into a standardized super tanker, which will be essential for the way in which different technologies can be applied. Next slide, please. So I'll rattle through the recommendations. You can read them in greater detail in the report, which has just popped up, hopefully through a linkage in the chat room. Um, first of all, we think we need to level up our data sets across the UK and make them truly reflect population minorities and make the data work for rare disease prevalence in many minorities of the population, which uh, our data sets don't truly reflect at the moment. Secondly, and echoing what Mark just described from the ethics work stream, um, we really need to restart a mature conversation with the public about the benefits of using health data for genomic um, breakthroughs, but also the, what risk mitigations we're going to put in place to ensure that we continue that confidence building. I mean, we, we've had a three year gap since the excellent work that Nicola Perrin did on understanding patient data through the Wellcome Trust on behalf of the NHS. And our group felt we'd lost time uh, GPDPR hasn't really helped carry the conversation forward particularly, and we now need to restart that to fill the vacuum. And the emphasis is, was very much on a mature conversation with the public. Thirdly, um, we're recommending we need, um, still with ethics, uh, a new national policy framework on the obligations and responsibilities of all the actors in the ecosystem, starting from the belief that we, we're operating in a world of public goods here, and therefore how data is protected, how it's used, 
how citizens exercise choice is an absolutely essential ingredient. Fourthly, um, we should make consent and even cohort sign up much easier than it is today. And uh, we potentially have a quick win with the NHS app, the NHS app, in a sense, uh, one of the beneficial outcomes of COVID is to uh, create roughly about 5 million users of the NHS app today, and that's rising very rapidly. So there's a quick win opportunity in being able to, to use that technology in a way that people are beginning to understand um, is proprietary to them. Sorry, next slide, please. Fifthly, um, smart data linkage with purposeful outcomes. I, I know you'll hear from Sharon and Gil some of their views on creating new longitudinal data, um, but we actually need uh, support from the government, as I've said, to fund a major cleansing exercise and to help us put in place standards and tools to enable it, data to be shared across the infrastructure by those authorized into the ecosystem. That I hope will come forward as a recommendation which becomes enacted in the SR bid, which is forthcoming over the autumn. And, and therefore the timing of this recommendation is I think uh, again, very appropriate. Sixthly, um, we need to update uh, what we've called the next gen ethics and governance infrastructure to help us um, share data widely and safely. Um, and finally, uh, we recommend investing in a whole of life, otherwise called longitudinal cohorts, which will for the first time help us link omics with sociodemographic data and lifestyle data, multimodal clinical data, um, to begin understanding the impact of socio-demographics and, and lifestyle on the potential for genomic variants to manifest themselves in different disease, disease traits. So I hope um, those recommendations are material. Next slide, please. In terms of the way governments and uh, responsible actors in the genomics revolution um, take forward our ideas on data and infrastructure. Um, the government has a big role to play here. We're absolutely convinced of this. It triggered the 100,000 Genome pro Program back in 2013-14. And you know, by all definitions of what is a sensible return on investment, our work stream was, is convinced that the payback to both humanity and the British economy could be really quite huge here. The NHS needs to accelerate its own digital strategy and particularly the data, data linkage and interoperability agenda with much more of a genomics paradigm behind its investment priorities than it's had to date. Research has to deliver some quick work wins. We're convinced that the research community, the scientific community also has to earn the right, the public right to invest in genomics revolution. And those quick wins need to come through in ways where the public is, is seeing confidence in the, in the benefits to them. Patients deserve the transparent and mature dialogue that I spoke about and as other, others have commented, clinicians need training in both the counseling of patients around genomic results and in clinical pathway design. So we called it a team sport. The whistle has blown. We're sort of coming to the end of the first half probably of this game, but the second half of the game is going to need huge degrees of collaboration common policy, common purpose, common belief, and absolutely total commitment to making Britain the world leader in this, in this science. Thank you, John. Thank you, Noel. That's great. That's great. 
Uh, let me pass on quickly uh, to the next speaker, that is uh, Sharon, if you can uh, take up your, uh, your theme on pathogens. Thank you very much, John. And it's a delight to be here to talk about uh, pathogen surveillance and infection management. Um, my co-chair uh, is Professor Paul Kellum. Um, and uh, I thank him very much for his really active participation in, in co-chairing this, this theme. I'd also um, like to thank the participants. Now they were uh, without question, very busy with the pandemic response, actually providing SARS-CoV-2 genomes. And it's extremely uh, um, generous of them to give their time to us. Now, next slide, please. Really, when the uh, uh, COVID-19 occurred, pathogen genomics was really in a state of readiness because of the past. We had strong UK engagement across over more than a decade, actually, to explore the potential of pathogen genomics. That included academia, public health agencies, etc. We also had very good funding in the space. So for the last 10 years, we've been working very hard on pathogen genomics. And then there were two pieces that really helped us uh, in, to drive that into policy and practice. The first was the 100,000 Genomes Project in 2013, which actually had three themes in it, cancer and rare diseases, but perhaps slightly less talked about was a pathogens theme, which I chaired, that highlighted the need to routinely sequence TB, hepatitis C, and do deep sequencing on HIV to detect uh, minor variants that could be resistant to antiretroviral treatment. And genomic surveillance of foodborne pathogens is now part of routine practice for public health agencies. The second that helped to drive forward uh, uh, the uh, uh, generation genome is uh, Sally, Dame Sally Davis's annual report, volume two in 2016, which had an entire chapter describing many of the benefits of sequencing bacteria and viruses. Now in that chapter, it was described that one could use sequencing for outbreaks. And in fact, uh, uh, academia and public health agencies gained considerable experience during other outbreaks, including MERS, Ebola, and Zika. MRC had also funded something called CLIME, which is a cloud infrastructure for microbial bi bioinformatics, which was used rapidly during the COVID response as well as Arctic, which is a, a network that uh, works on areas such as methodolog uh, methodology. Next slide, please. So we were in the starting blocks uh, for uh, sequencing in COVID-19. Next. So if we look at our response in pathogen genomics in the UK, I would say it is an exemplary, resp exemplary response. We were one of the, amongst the first to develop a, a capability to generate SARS-CoV-2 genomes at scale and use this for public health impact. That was through the COVID-19 Genomics UK Consortium, which started on the 1st of April 2020. The pandemic has also shown beyond any doubt that sequencing generates actionable information that supports an effective response that includes developing vaccines initially, uh, guiding vaccine development uh, thereafter, uh, looking at the emergence of resistance to other therapeutics, looking at the uh, transmission of, of variants, particularly variants of concern around the world and more localized transmission. Next slide, please. So coming to this work stream, we've already got, we've already had something of a mini revolution in the UK in that we've generated more than a million viral genomes for SARS-CoV-2, which is quite extraordinary. But actually what we need to do now is to build on these existing capabilities to provide a high quality infrastructure that integrates pathogen genomics, longitudinal clinical data and host sequence data, including data from the severely ill. We need to bring that all together. So we're at, at the start of an incredible uh, time in the UK in terms of data uh, linkage and what we can discover from that. Now our work theme had uh, made six recommendations uh, which start on the next slide, please. Now, the first three recommendations are really about future-proofing uh, the system. So the first is that the UK must build an end-to-end -end pathogen diagnostics and surveillance system for the next decade and beyond. Now, some points to make here is that 
we need to build on strong foundations we have, but we need to take account of several factors that will actually influence that in the next few years. The first is that there's going to be an inevitable growth in the number of, of use cases for pathogen sequencing. We'll want to use it for more reasons, which will increase demand. Second is that I'm, I believe firmly that scientific advances in sequencing technology will allow us to both sequence more closely to patient care and, 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 and uh, potentially in the community, but certainly moving towards the patient and link data more effectively. Now, as both of those transitions occur, there's gonna be an increasing overlap between sequencing for public health and for diagnostic and patient focused reasons. So we're going to need to think about a new blended operating model that we need to balance the benefits and challenges of centralized versus near patient sequencing with very close integration with public health agencies and protocols that allow sharing and analysis of data and information for everybody for surveillance and research. Now to make this sequencing accessible for patient care, we're also going to need more automated bioinformatics pipelines that interpret the data very rapidly and give end users information that they can use and understand, as well as using uh, artificial intelligence to make rapid use of the data. Now, the next uh, recommendation is around surge capacity. We need enough surge capacity for sequencing built into public health agencies, the NHS and academia in the event of another significant pandemic. Now, I believe that we made a very good and very rapid response to sequencing uh, this time around. But actually, that surge sequencing has largely come from academic institutions with a reduction in their other work. We really need to build sufficient surge capacity to prepare for future serious outbreaks, and that will require strong and deep relationships between the NHS and academic institutions to enable some cross-functional work, cross working and shared capacity. Now, the last recommendation on this slide is about uh, data sharing of pathogen genomes. We need to share these uh, with public health agencies, but also with, uh, with researchers. We need a two-way flow of information. Now, the infrastructure and learning from Climb COVID, which was our uh, platform for uh, SARS-CoV-2, is really the starting point for plans for a pathogen genomics infrastructure in, in, UK, in UK public health. But we need to go further than that because we need linked pathogen information to electronic health records, making this information available to specific researchers through a trusted research environment. That will enhance our scientific understanding and research into, into disease and make the UK uh, really leading in this field. Next slide, please. Now, the next set of recommendations are really uh, for the governments here. And as, as, as before, you heard Noel talk about the involvement of government, very much the case for our theme. The first is that the UK government should incentivize the further development of sequencing technologies by medtech. Now, there's going to come a tipping point at which sequencing replace, replaces or is used alongside other types of diagnostic tests for infectious diseases. And this is going to require significant increase in availability and location of diagnostic sequencing and the technology for near patient sequencing, which is going to require significant innovation. The, uh, the next recommendation is that the UK government should invest in research and development to establish the role of metagenomics services in the UK. Now, metagenomics is a study of genetic material from a sample that has a mixed microbial community. Wastewater is a good example, but clinical samples from non-sterile sites, such as the upper respiratory tract is another good example. Now we need to, to maximize the benefits from sequencing of samples from patients by looking at how we can sequence directly from these samples, which are often quite complex samples, and be able to interpret that for the benefit of patients. Finally, we need to establish a genomics observatory service, or we need to recommend for the government to establish a genomics service, which really combines metagenomics, environmental health, animal health, public health, and the NHS data to provide genomic surveillance for public health. Now, this aggregation uh, of data could also be, uh, uh, you could apply predictive analytics um, and it could detect new emerging uh, threats as well as taking account of wider public health contexts such as health inequalities and climate change. And these plans really create building blocks for international surveillance. My final slide, please. So we are of the view that there's a potential for data linkage to really uh, cause a leapfrog in our understanding of disease, disease causation, and prediction 
in about comes from disease. And we are putting together the SARS-CoV-2 genomes with a host genetics, together with information on, on their immunological status, underlying uh, comorbidities, their treatment and uh, their physiological measurements to really understand about um, uh, outcomes from COVID-19. We believe this is a model for future working. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon. That's excellent. Uh, now, can I pass quickly on to our uh, final speaker, uh, Gil McVean. Um, Gil. Can Thanks, you... John. I shall be brief. Uh, so I'm going to give an overview of the recommendations that lie in the fields of prevention and detection. Uh, my name is Gil McVean. I'm the CSO at Genomics PLC and a professor at the University of Oxford. Like the other speakers, uh, I was privileged to spend time with a really diverse panel of individuals representing everything from the basic science through to public health to consider the role of genomics in prevention and early detection. Um, and what is being recommended here is the combined views of that group. So if we go to the next slide. It, as other speakers have mentioned, um, the COVID pandemic has really sort of shown up many of the areas in which the, the UK uh, health service needs to, to, to move and, and also the potential role for genomics in enabling that transition. Whether it's looking at the strain that ar arises from all of the postponed regular screening events or the role that uh, preventable diseases like type 2 diabetes played as key risk factors uh, for severe outcomes in COVID, or um, just identifying people who, who really are at incredibly high risk of bad outcomes from a whole range of different factors for COVID. The ability to stratify populations into people who are at different levels of risk, and importantly, where you can do something about it before that risk is manifest, is clearly a critical um, element of any future strategy for dealing with the UK's um, health burden. And as such, uh, prevention and early detection is very much a key feature of the NHS's long-term plan. So where does genetics come into this? Why, why does genetics play a role in prevention? Well, the key thing is that for many common diseases, not all, but for many common diseases with severe unmet clinical need, inherited risk factors, genetic factors, are actually the single strongest risk factor. There are other things that are important, but actually the single most important thing is genetics. If you look on the chart on the right, this shows the life, the incidence of breast cancer among women in three different groups. Blue is the population average. So uh, by, by age of 80, about 10 to 13% of women have had uh, breast cancer on average. But if you stratify the population into those who have been unfortunate to inherit a very high, what is called a polygenic risk for breast cancer, so these are not people with um, rare familial mutations in BRCA1 or BRCA2 or similar genes. These are people who have who inherited many different small effects uh, affecting the risk of breast cancer, which have added up to a very severe uh, increased risk. So if you take the top 3% of the population, that is the red line, you can see that their lifetime risk for breast cancer is over 30%, which puts them in the high risk category. And perhaps more importantly, even before they've hit the age of 40, their risk of breast cancer is already over that of an average woman aged 50, which is when the national screening program um, starts. So genetics is an incredibly important factor in determining future risk, and perhaps even more importantly, genetics can be read and its impact on risk can be understood years or even decades before any symptoms appear. So that puts it at a somewhat unique position in being able to direct services, whether that's screening or preventative medicine, towards those subpopulations that are indeed at the highest risk. Now, the science behind this is incredibly strong, and the UK, as other people have noted, has been truly uh, sort of world-leading in its investment 
to create the foundational data sources and resources that have allowed us to get to this level of understanding, whether it's programs like UK Biobank or Genomics England 100,000 Genomes Project or the upcoming Our Future Health work. The, the amount of um, coordination and funding that's gone in to develop the, the ultimately the data sources and the, the engagement with uh, participant communities to enable us to get to this point of science it has been remarkable. Moreover, um, as others have mentioned, the pandemic has more, um, even more than that, driven many of the enablers of uh, a what a, a field that can be called genomic prevention, which is the use of genetic information to um, further stratify risk and target interventions to high risk groups. So these are things like effective data sharing, as I was talking about, at home testing, you know, that is something that's become routine. Every household now does at home testing and feeds that into the, the healthcare system. The visibility of genomic data and the role that risk stratification plays as a key component of uh, pub public health. So next slide, please. So with that in mind, um, where do we go from here? What are the key things that the UK needs to do to be able to capitalise on our position at the very forefront of opportunity in terms of prevention, genomic prevention and early detection? Well, I think there's sort of one really strong underlying theme here which is we've kind of got ourselves to a great place in terms of the science. We're really ahead of the field in terms of the science. But what we really need to do now is to work out how to put that into practice. How do we actually change clinical pathways? How do we care, change the care of individual, um, uh, individual patients or participants in these programs so as to end up with better outcomes compared to what we're doing today? And so our four themes, our four recommendations are all around how we can push that agenda, the implementation agenda, if you like. So the first of those is around the integration of genetic risk stratification with national screening programs. I showed you the, the, uh, the, the rate of breast cancer for which there is a national screening program on the previous slide. There are other programs such as uh, bowel cancer screening where again, genetic risk can play a really important part in feeding into the prioritization of individuals for screening, either putting their screening earlier, potentially changing the frequency of screening, potentially changing the, um, the uh, direction of expensive or resource limited follow up such as colonoscopy in the case of bowel cancer to those individuals who have particularly high uh, genetic risk. So that, that work is, is sort of ready to go in a way because we have the science and we have the clear pathways that are already able to deal with risk information. But what we absolutely need is the careful, um, the trials essentially, and the modeling of those trials to understand how to optimize um, the care pathways so as to get the best outcomes for everyone. The second set of recommendations, and please read the report for um, details of this, is around how we can improve prediction for early detection over short time periods. So genetics gives you your lifetime risk, it can give you risk over shorter periods of time, but really where genetics is most useful is telling you what's going to happen over really long periods of time. And what we often care about is of those people at high risk, who are the ones who are actually about to enter disease or who are in the very earliest stages of disease. And so that is where there's an opportunity to combine the risk stratification with a growing investigation of biomarkers, whether it's the, the work of the um, early detection of cancer DNA floating around blood that Mark has already talked about, or potentially um, highly expensive um, uh, and resource limited investigations into individuals who may be showing the earliest signs of disease. So there's a question about how we combine that risk stratification with identifying those people who are on, on the trajectory to disease. There's also a huge opportunity to combine um, genomic risk information with primary care prevention pathways. 
So whether we're talking about cardiovascular disease or type 2 diabetes, there are very powerful existing preventative approaches which are directed towards particular strata of the population. Our recommendation is that, like for the screening programs, there are trials which are about working out how the information that comes from genetics can be combined with existing conventional risk factors that are used to prioritize people for these preventative pathways can be combined to make a much more powerful combined tool. And then finally, um, one of the most sort of remarkable insights from the 100,000 Genomes Project is really the power of whole genome sequencing to both perform diagnosis, but also to pick up risks for individuals of really serious debilitating um, disorders for which there are early life interventions. And so we recommend that there's um, a pilot of whole genome sequencing in newborns to really, as with all the other points, to really push on the implementation question. How much value do we get from doing this? The science is good, but how, how do we implement it? And how do we characterize the clinical and health economic benefits from this activity? So those are the, the uh, recommendations. Um, and I think all I'd say to finish is that we think from, from the point of view of genomic prevention, the UK is in an incredibly strong position and combined with the other recommendations from the other pillars of this report, there's a huge opportunity for the UK to, to really lead at a world level. Thank you, John. Thank you, Gil. Uh, and thank you for all the speakers. Um, we have uh, just a few minutes uh, to tackle questions, and we have a few questions in front of us. Those that we can't tackle now, uh, uh, we will make sure there is an answer. Uh, but uh, let me start uh, uh, with this one, which asks uh, about um, uh, uh, the use of uh, genomics uh, as surveillance and uh, population level insights become com commonplace. Does there need to be more consideration about lifelong care and support based upon an understanding of a person's genome? Uh, um, uh, Gil, I think that's basically for you. I don't know if Mark would like uh, to follow up at all uh, with something about the, um, the healthcare consequences. Thanks. Uh, so I, I, I'm 100% behind this. I think the, the point that we'd like to make is that it, you know, genomics is for life. You, you, the information you have at birth can be informative about events from early childhood through to the, the latest um, stages of life. Therefore, what we need to have is a framework within the UK for thinking about the lifelong um, maintenance of, well, initially the collection, then the lifelong maintenance of that genetic information alongside healthcare data so that whenever you're, uh, for every interface between you and the healthcare system, genomics is part of, of that, um, uh, that, that contact. And it's being used to help make better decisions all along the way. Thank you. Mark, do you want to add anything to that? Just one thing. I think it's absolutely right. I completely agree with Gil. I just add one point, which is that in 76,000 whole genomes, 99.5% of us have a change in our DNA, which means if we come across certain medicines, they either won't work or they will be harmful. If that's the case, um, data gathered in this way, as Gil is describing, will be hugely important across the life course eventually. And we do need to do what the question suggests. Right. We we'll probably have time for just one more uh, question. Uh, this one is from Tim Hubbard. Uh, hello, him, Tim. Um, right. Uh, uh, here, Tim asks, um, uh, in terms of global pathogen monitoring, is there an, any engagement with WHO? Um, which I hope there is, uh, but given the investment by Germany to fund a data hub in Berlin. Uh, Sharon, I think that's possibly something yeah. you can help with. Thanks very much, John. Uh, uh, hello, Tim. Um, the answer is yes. And so the Department of Health and Social Care are in discussion uh, with Berlin, um, as is UKHSA. Uh, I think that, that this is a fairly early uh, juncture at the moment, uh, but there's certainly a lot of discussion going on. So. Uh, I'm hopeful that we will, we will be um, involved 
uh, in that uh, program of work. Thank you. Well, then I think probably just squeeze in uh, an answer on the data side uh, to, uh, for a question comes from Charlotte Jennings. Thanks for your question, Charlotte. Uh, um, uh, does a closed TRE offer the ability for full integration with multiple data sources or collaboration with all industry academic partners in the ecosystem? I think, Noel, that's one for you. I think you're muted at the moment. Sorry, John. Thank yes, I, I was saying I think it's actually one for my co-chair, Andrew, Andrew, who isn't here, but um, given he was one of the architects of TRE. <clears throat> um, I think we probably have a way to go. Uh, we're really at the foothills of exploring how to use trusted research environments. I know Andrew has been very keen proponent of on-premise data and uh, authentication and protocols to surround it, but um, I think we have yet to work out exactly what the right answer is going to be to our next generation of TREs. But I, I think absolutely um, federating the data, making it more accessible, giving people better analytic tools, having the right protocols around usage of the data is, is part of that next gen that we are trying to develop. I don't know if other experts might have a comment on it as well, John. Uh, I think that's um, uh, that, that's a very fair comment uh, that we have at the moment. We, we could speak at some time, and if Andrew was here, he might be tempted. Um, but uh, I think that uh, that covers it for the moment. And indeed, we are very near uh, the end of our available uh, time. Um, and so I would just like to thank everybody uh, for participating and hand uh, the final word across uh, to Mark. So thank you. I'll add my thanks to all the speakers, uh, to the hundred participants who took part in this exercise and gave freely of their time. I should like to thank Public Policy Projects for inviting us to do this, and particularly Anna Dickinson, who shepherded us through this process. I should also like to thank um, Perkin Elmer and uh, Roche for providing the funds that enable the administration of this work um, and uh, allowed us to do this. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you, every single one of you for giving up your time uh, to be here today. And we hope the report is of value to you. And uh, thank you all so much. And I thank um, others who are working on global genomics in parallel projects in public policy projects, uh, because that will complement the work that's been done here. Thank you all very much.